this world. And it's not just in the United States, it's all over the world. And um, I confess that sometimes I want to say to God, can you just not do some more? Can you, you know, just step in and say, here I am, and boom, you know. And, and it doesn't work like that. You know, he does what he's going to do, the way he's going to do it, and in the time he's going to do it. And it's all part of a plan. So there is an invisible rain right now, um, which will be visible eventually. But I'm like, can we get going? You know, that's just my, my nature that needs to be redeemed and, and conform to the image of Jesus. And I, I'm joking a little bit, but... You know, sometimes you just get frustrated. And and it's mostly because I want to see God glorified. I, I want to see, that's what I, I, I hate people living in rebellion against him. So this is as much for me <laughs> as it is for you. And I can go this route as well. And, um, and I've been praying it. And I just don't know which way to go. And so this will be there in case we don't go down that road and go Ephesians, I, I wanted to put that up there at least so that you can get a feel for what, for example, what is the kingdom of God, right? That's a major area of teaching of Jesus. In Matthew, it's called the kingdom of heaven. Elsewhere, it's called the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of heaven? It is the rule and reign of God spiritually now but then when Jesus comes back, it will be present and visible just like it is now. He will rule and reign from Jerusalem in complete peace, justice, and righteousness. No more war, no more any of that. And we're going to rule and reign with him. That's what the Bible teaches. So I have to encourage myself that this is where we're heading. And, and so man's kingdoms are are coming to ruination. That's where, when we see all that's going on, what we're seeing is God's plan to allow man to come to an end. But in the meantime, man is responsible. So for example, I can't tell you how many times in sharing the gospel with people, um, I have had people say to me, well, I'm not going to believe in a I don't believe in a God who would allow evil. How can you say God is a loving God and there's evil everywhere? But the reality is evil is a, is a demonstration of the reality of God because he tells us what's good and what's evil and he gives man the choice to, to have a free will. So we're created in his image and according to his likeness. I want to say to man, why are you allowing evil? God wants to say to man, why do you allow evil? You know what's right. You know what's wrong. But you don't choose to do what's right. And when you do that, then evil fills the void. So that alone is a demonstration of the reality of God because we have standards of right and wrong. And throughout the whole world, everyone knows that murder is evil, for example, right? And many other things. Stealing is evil. It doesn't matter what culture is stealing is wrong. Right? So man is the one that God has given man the responsibility to rule and reign. And as man turns away from him, Psalm 2, then we see the results of what takes place. But when we turn to him, generally speaking, not always, even in the church, when we turn to him and obey him, <clears throat> then we see his redemption in the, in the earth. Then we see love. Then we see mercy. Then we see kindness. We see service. And it's not, and, and, and it's all to glorify God, whereas the world will serve to get something, generally speaking, even though they're created in the image of God. Um, so so that's, that's kind of a, a brief, so the kingdom of God is already, but not yet. Remember, Jesus said the kingdom of God is in your midst, and yet the kingdom of God is coming. So Gerhard Vos, uh, where is he? He's a uh, previous generation Princeton theologian, is the one that coined the term already, but not yet. 
So right now it's a spiritual reign. What is a spiritual reign? Remember Nicodemus said, how, how can, remember he, Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom and you cannot see the kingdom. So you had to explain to Nicodemus what that whole thing meant. So the focus now is on entering, is on people entering the kingdom through repentance and faith in Jesus. Remember what, what did he do? He came preaching the gospel of repentance, right? And um, the, the two brothers in Luke 12 got into a legal dispute. They said, look, one brother said, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. And Jesus said, look, I'm not here to deal with that. But I'm here to reveal your hearts. And then he goes on and gives a parable of their greed. So the kingdom of God's emphasis now is spiritual. But we have the Old Testament and the New Testament that tell us that one day it will remain spiritual, but it also will be physical. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the, with the kid. Uh, the nations will take their instruments of warfare and, and uh, uh, refine them into, in, into instruments of peace. They will not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And that's in the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Jesus, and then into the eternal state. So I'm encouraging myself, and I'm hopefully encouraging you to have a, uh, we have to have a broader picture. We have to be able to get up high with a bird's eye view and understand from God's perspective what's going on in the world. What, what really is happening in the world? If the main focus is a spiritual reign, then we are partnering with him to establish that reign. And the kingdom is even bigger than the church. So the church is just part of the overall kingdom. And we're the ones that extend his kingdom influence in the world. That's why there's such a clash. Because the world powers and the world religions are living in defiance of Jesus. And so when we come and we bring forth God's new society, then for those that don't want it, there's a clash. There's a resistance. There's, there's not just a resistance, there's an overt attack. Because, because the... Psalm 2 says, why are the nations in an uproar? And the kings of the earth, the kings of the rulers of the earth, take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed, Mashiach, Messiah. And when they say, let us come and tear their fetters apart, that is, they view God as constricting them. Right? That's what's going on. God is a constrictor. God is a killjoy. God is this. God is that. And God's nature is entirely different from that. But if they want to continue to rebel, then they will run up against his justice and his righteousness and his holiness. So does that, does this help? That's a quick overview of, of our world today, but also of where the world is heading. So... Revelation makes it clear it's gonna it's not gonna get better until Jesus returns. And um, it's not gonna get better until Jesus returns, but we have hope that God will have the last word over sin. And we have to remind ourselves, first Peter, Hebrews, that we are aliens and strangers here. We the more we try to fit that square, that what is it, square peg in a round hole, or either way, we try to we try to force it, force ourselves to fit in this world, but we can't. And the more we try, the more frustrated. It doesn't mean that we can't enjoy what God has given us. We can enjoy the birds and the bees and all that, just like anybody else, probably more so if we understand why God created that. But but ultimately, our home is in heaven. And that's what Paul wants to get over to us. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will redeem our, 
our mortal bodies into bodies like his. Do you follow me on that? So yes, we're citizens of the United States. Yes, we have responsibility to be the best citizens of the country that we live in, in a redemptive way. But my loyalty is first and foremost to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, more than it is to a man or, or, or an earthly ruler. But because of who he is, then I, I have to do my best to respect those who are in authority and pray for them. And um, so I think it, it, I'm joking. It's not just for me. It, it's for all of us because we, we can tend to be myopic in our, our worldview and, and think this is all there is. But then God wants to take those blinders and enable us to have peripheral vision and enable us to look down and look up and say, this is not all there is. <laughs> this is just, this is a snapshot. And, but that snapshot is, is like a, you know, moving picture. It's just one frame. And we're in the middle of the movie right now. Maybe we're more towards the end of the movie. And where it's heading, it doesn't look like it's promising. You know, good movies can turn things around and you're surprised at the way they end. That's where we're headed. So, um, well, I just, I, I asked you what you wanted to do, but I, I think I just did that, and then we're going to go to Ephesians 1. So, but any thoughts or questions on that? Crystal? Um, like the difference between heaven and New Jerusalem, because like it says our, you know, our citizenship is in heaven, but like maybe in Revelations, you know, like New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem comes down to the earth, and mm -hmm. that's where we would live. So would that be like New Heaven, or like how does that? Yeah, it's <coughs> um, the idea here is that the present Earth and uh, really the entire universe, as large as that is, has been corrupted by sin, and so God is going to renew it all. Um, the heavens, the present heavens and the earth will pass away with a loud, um, a loud, I can't remember the word that's used there. But God is going to replace it with a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. But from everything I understand, it's going to be exactly what this is. Because what he created was good. Remember, that's why, that's why Genesis 1 is so important. All that he created was good. It's sin that destroyed it. God is, is a redeemer. He's going to redeem everything that sin destroyed, including the animals, including us, supernatural, spiritual bodies. And so what's already existent right now, the New Jerusalem, uh, then will come down and replace the current Jerusalem, but albeit in a renewed um, world, if you will. So, with renewed people. And so, what began in Genesis and failed will continue in Revelation 21 and 22 and not fail. And that's, that's, the, that's the trajectory where we're going. And that's why we are people of hope. That's why we're people of destiny. And, and we're not going to just sit around twiddling our thumbs in heaven. Um, and all we're going to do is be in a worship service. That's not what it is. It's, it'll make this world the best times you ever had like this in comparison to what heaven is like. And this world, Hebrew says, is only a pattern of what already exists in heaven. So we tend to think this is all there is. No, we're, we're living in a, a Philippine um, dump. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of, of um, where people live in the slums in the Philippines or India or Mexico. As, I mean, it's, it's as bad as it gets. That's what this whole world is like. And I don't care whether you live in the beautiful, most beautiful mansion in Beverly Hills or Connecticut or, or, or France or whatever. It doesn't matter. It is garbage compared 
to heaven because that's what sin has done. It's degraded us. Uh, God is in the business of, of taking us from being degraded to honor. That's what glory is all about. You see that over and over and over in the New Testament. God is about glorifying his people. We're going to see that in, in Ephesians. Well, glory is honor. So we can't see that right now. But that's what he's doing. So he's taking us from being his enemies and children of wrath to exalting us to such a high place that we're going to rule and reign with him. Now that's amazing. And give us brand new bodies. Spiritual bodies. No more death. No COVID. No malaria. No cholera. No <laughs> things I'm praying against. None of that stuff. No aging. No no math no, tests. No, no math tests. Yeah. Pharmacies. No, no doctor tests. bills. No no fatigue. No arguing. No no misunderstanding. Uh, none of that stuff. This, this is what I'm trying to impart, is this, this vision of God making us more than conquerors through Christ. Not just here, but forever. So, Cynthia. Okay, so, it, when I die, I go to heaven. Immediately. But I, but I don't get a new body yet. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, when Jesus comes back down... Mm -hmm. That's when I get a new body to reign with him. Yes. On the earth, in, out of Jerusalem. Yes. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, for for seven years? Is that for seven? a thousand years. For a thousand years. Mm -hmm. That's okay. the millennium. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. the millennium. And mm -hmm. then what happens after that? So then what, what is astonishing is during that thousand year reign, there are going to be people on the earth, to the best of my understanding, that once they're still alive when the millennium begins and they submit, there are going to be nations that submit to the Lord with feigned obedience. So they don't obey from the heart. And so the Bible teaches that Satan and his demons are cast into the pit for that thousand years. Mm -hmm. So presumably there's no temptation. Mm -hmm. And I think what the reason for that is God is going to show man that his evil nature is not just because of the devil, but he can live in idyllic circumstances and still not submit from the heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw that. I know this is not the best example, but I remember I was a campus pastor at Bethany University for just one year. And you couldn't have had better conditions, so to speak, and yet, the students still lived in rebellion against God. So they had wonderful professors. They had wonderful this, that, and the other. But, but they looked to get away with whatever they could get away with. And many of those students are no longer walking with the Lord. Mm -hmm. They sat in chapel. They sat in classes with professors that loved them and blessed them and honored them. But such is the, the nature of man's rebellious heart that he can live in perfect conditions and still su not submit to the Lord. And so at the end of that millennium, Satan is let out for a short time to deceive the nations. And the Bible says they will come up against the, the camp of the saints and surround the camp of the saints. And then without a fight, that's it. Jesus steps in and destroys them all. They've had a thousand years to watch him, to live under his beneficent reign. No complete peace, justice, and righteousness. No means. None of that. And still not submit to the heart, from the heart. And then that begins the eternal state. So the millennium is over with. And then in the eternal state, there are no sinners, no sin, none of that. That, that is the trajectory, that's, that's the direction of where we're heading. Let me go to um, Taylor and then Crystal. Oh, I was just thinking you were commenting on still being rebellious because I was taught there's three enemies. There's Satan, our flesh, and then the world system. Mm -hmm. So it's the flesh. And yes, it's the flesh, it's the fallen nature, and right. God is 
working on them. The Holy Spirit is convicting them. Uh, God is not willing that any should perish. It's his kindness that leads men to repentance. And so he, he gives grace and grace and grace. Here, over here with my rotten attitude, I'm saying, can you please, you know, step in and judge. Bring your wrath down. And, and even this morning, I felt the Lord say, your heart's not right. You don't have the love that I love. I have. You don't see the reality of heaven, even though you have a strong conviction, like I do. And so there's that idea that, whoa, I need to take a step back. And there's a good reason that Jesus is the Messiah, and I'm not. <laughs> right? Um, so because he, he is slow to anger. And abounding in loving kindness. So I'm trying to be slow to anger. And abounding in loving kindness just like him. But if he gave me the keys. I, I Alright, so when you were answering the question about like the end times as far as like the, um, the rebellion that happens after the mm -hmm. rain. So, like, there was two angels, Raphael, and then the other one that I read in the book of Enoch that were um, bond, bounded at that, I think, mean, Euphrates. Mm -hmm. But then in the Revelation, there's two angels, so the names. So do you think there is, like, legitimacy with the book of Enoch when it comes to certain aspects? Yeah, so the book of Enoch is extra biblical. It's not part of the canon of Scripture. The canon is the standard of scripture, 66 books, 39 Old Testament, 22 New Testament. But um, a lot of the non-canonical books are helpful for um, history and culture and to understand what, insofar as they were written by Jewish people, they're, they're helpful in the area of scholarship. But Paul said, don't go beyond what is written. And so the only, the only archangel in scripture is Michael. Michael is the archangel. Gabriel is thought to be an archangel, but he's never called the, an archangel. But um, we can say it, it, it appears like he's an archangel. He's the, innate, he's the angel of annunciation. He is the one that announced the birth of the Messiah and, um, and other things as well. So yes, there are other angels like Raphael that are named in the non-canonical books. Um, but again, Scripture doesn't name any more angels than those two. And so, but, but that's a prominent part of, especially the book of Revelation, also Daniel. Those angels have a major role in, uh, in Scripture and in salvation history. And right now, you know, there's no question in my mind that there are angels in this room and sometimes God gives us the discerning of spirits and and opens our eyes to recognize the presence of angels I've sensed that in worship services on Sunday mornings but the discerning of spirits is also for demonic spirits That's right. to discern you know when they're there and when the, how they're operating in the lives of people Maureen cautioned me uh, she she had a word for me about Uganda about a wolf in sheep's clothing and I had a very vivid dream the other night mm. of uh, was driving through a small village very slowly because people all over the place and um, so I was really slow and there was a woman walking she had her head down she had two little children like she was planning to walk in front of my car and someone reached in and grabbed her and stopped her and we we went on well is she in this dream um, claimed that I hit one of the kids and took me to court. It was a very jarring dream. You know, one of those mm -hmm. were, you know, so was, the effort was to deceive yeah. and to take get money and to to swell Swind my reputation. Swindle. Swindle. That's the word we got. So, you know, so it's just God will do those things and give you discernment, and then discerning of spirits is for a human spirit as well, and so is to look. At uh, beyond when someone is dealing with something. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you really doing? And then maybe God gives you a word of knowledge. Are you going through this right now? Yes. How would you know? I didn't, but the Holy Spirit does. Boom, he wants to bring encouragement, right? 
That's how the discerning of spirits can operate in human spirits, or it can it, discerning of spirits can operate in detecting something that's not good, like I had to deal with with an elder of a church that I pastored who had a Jezebel spirit, which is you can list 33 <coughs> aspects of Jezebel, and and 30 of them were in operation in this man. It's a powerful thing to deal with. And it got me out of the church, humanly speaking, mm -hmm. even though, you know, I was innocent, but yet God worked behind the scenes to launch me in a different direction. So, um, wow, wouldn't plan on going in, on in that, but, but angels are, 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 God uses angels to minister to us, right? They minister to Jesus, mm -hmm. right? That's amazing. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they strengthened him. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's nothing wrong with asking God to use his angels to minister to us, to protect us, to fight for us. That's what they do. All right, Betty. Oh, piggybacking what you're saying, maybe. But I think that um, as I've been in this class, I'm more aware of things that come to me and it, mm -hmm. for no reason. And I know... Where did that come from? Um, I think about I think about my daughter. She'll hit my mind just like that, and then she'll call with some concern. Mm -hmm. And I think the moment that I realized, and I kind of, hey, this is God speaking to me in an indirect way was when I was teaching last September, and three weeks into it, it was just so stressful all of the technology and everything they wanted me to do. I'm out mowing my lawn and you no know, throwing grass seeds in my lawn, not thinking about any school and just, just throwing it, just getting really tired. And I took a break to sit down. And all of a sudden something came in my mind and said, you can't do it anymore. Mm. You can't do it anymore. Mm. And I don't know why it came in, but it was just like that. And mm. I, I called my brother obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> this is my rock. And, mm -hmm. and I talked to him. I'm, I'm crying hysterical because oh. I had to make a decision that I needed to resign from teaching. I just could not take all of the stress that was going on mm -hmm. with me, with my husband and mm -hmm. everything else. And then everything we were going on school. And I just felt, I just felt like I can't do it anymore. And I felt that relief. But then, as I went on, I realized it wasn't that I can't teach anymore, no. but I can't do what they are asking me, so I had to moderate it. So I was telling my, my brother, and I was telling others, that that's the first time I thought that God spoke to me, that I acknowledged, I should say, yeah. that he spoke to me. For some reason, bam, it just came to my mind, you have to make a change. And wow. I think about it quite often, and it's coming up on a year, but I still think about, I do, now I do believe that he speaks to me, not that I didn't, but now I know yeah. that when I get these things, and I don't know where they came from or why they came in my mind, it's just not a coincidence so much as it is God speaking to me in an indirect way and making me think about something. Oh, that's beautiful, Betty. And that's that's Amen. a victory. That's 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 fruit from our times together. I'm rejoicing and and just to reinforce, I feel like this is a new thing almost. And it's not, but I just feel like I'm digging deeper into when someone is on my mind, good or bad, and um, that is God's prompting to pray for that situation, to pray for that person. I'm I feel like I'm. I guess maybe being refreshed in that way of, of learning the joy of being more sensitive to the presence of the Holy Spirit and to responding to those promptings and not just not just go down the road of oh well that person was on my mind um, generally speaking there's a reason for it and it's because the Holy Spirit wants us to pray for that person or pray for that situation and um, yeah, but so thank you, thank you for sharing that. Beautiful. Well, I'm ready to get to Ephesians one after Taylor's uh, whatever it is that she's got in mind. 
Here she comes. So, yeah. I'm glad you're doing this because yeah. I keep this in my wallet. Okay. From Ephesians 1 and 2. Are you serious? Yeah, I did it after I saw that movie Overcomer about the little um, girl with asthma, you know, was yeah. blood and yeah. mm -hmm. The what? <laughs> Priscilla Trier was the principal, told her to read those yeah. two chapters and she's her identity in Christ. Okay. Priscilla Shire is like Maureen's favorite preacher. Yeah. It's yeah. like she's, uh, Maureen favors Priscilla Shire over me because she's always <laughs> listening to her. Yeah. <laughs> I listen to you weekly. <laughs> <laughs> I, just said, I just wanted to show that. Yeah. in my wallet. This is beautiful. It's, and, it's so my identity, she yeah. writes, mm -hmm. with a, a heart. Who God says I am, Ephesians 1 and 2. I am blessed. I am chosen. I am adopted. I am accepted, I am redeemed, I am forgiven, I am an heir, I am sealed with the Holy Spirit, I am purchased, I am made alive, I am saved by His grace, I am His workmanship, I am loved. And she's got wow. verses next to that. But that's wow. all in Ephesians 1 and 2. And yeah. I just, once in a while, if I just, you know, just get, when you encourage yourself, I pull it out, it's in my yeah. wallet, and I read it, and I'm yeah. good to go. So I'm, uh -huh. just, I'm just glad you're doing I love it. Visiting. So let me ask you, what do you think God thinks about what she did? You think God just shrugs your shoulders and says, oh, nice, nice job, Doug. No, what do you no, think he, he thinks about yeah. that? Yeah. I would think he loves that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. why? She's, she's taking his word seriously. Mm -hmm. She's living under its liberating authority. Right? The authority of Scripture is the most important thing we can understand. It's for our liberation, not for our constriction. But it protects us, right? So it, it, that's the benefit. It's the benefit of a parent. A parent says no, right? <laughs> Why? Because the parent is wiser than the child, and the parent wants the liberty of the child, but the parent also wants the protection of the child, mm -hmm. right? Where do we get that from? Where does the idea of parenthood come from? It comes from the father. Yeah. See? And that's that's what that's all about. The child says, Whoa, why can't I do this? You're never allowed me to do that. What's going on there? There's rebellion. Right? Rebellion against authority. So the parent has to have the wisdom, the gentleness, and the firmness of we're not I'm not your friend. I'm not your buddy. I am your mom. I am your daddy. Well, the problem we have in our world today, okay, so I'm not going to. Too many parents who want to be friends. And that's that's when they become adults. Yeah, right? That, that sitting in the corner thing didn't work too well, did it? No, it didn't. But the paddle and the belt worked for me. Yeah, and I know too. So, when I was, you know, we're renewed by the transforming of our mind, mm -hmm. and we're, our mind is renewed by what we are meditating on. And so mm -hmm. by taking those thoughts and that's beginning that transformation mm -hmm. in our heart. That's right. I love it when Rick brings things in. He's such a teacher. So <laughs> let's let's go to Crystal and um, uh, uh, Taylor. Mm -hmm. I would say it also shows faith that you're believing what God says. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Taylor. I was just going to say, I remember years ago taking this class, Grown Kids God's Way. You know, you can't be friends with a two-year-old. We fast forward, my sons are 35 and 37. But the 35-year-old, he said this to me when he was 22. We were out doing like a matinee and brunch. And he said, you're not just my mom, you're my friend. And it just like, oh my goodness, it was oh, so beautiful. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. you know, he didn't always say that. It's like, you're a mean mommy. Yeah. <laughs> but that whole thing, yeah. And you friendship with your adults if you stick to the training biblically. Yeah. And it does yield yes. that fruit. That's it. Well, beautiful. Let's go to Ephesians 1. And uh, what do we do before we open up the Word? Pray. 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 So let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word. It is your inspired, inerrant, infallible Word, and it's for us, but it glorifies you. Now, we cannot understand a single thing uh, from your Word without your teaching Holy Spirit. We ask now that you would step in and teach us and that you would conform us into the image of our Savior. And we, and we pray that it would result in abounding fruit both now and forevermore in Jesus' name. 
amen, amen. and amen. All right, so here I am. I'm seated here at my desk, um, or I'm sitting outside. You're not here. I'm just reading Ephesians 1. Got my coffee there. I have to imagine it. It's right there. And uh, see, I associate coffee with the word. That's a good thing, right? Uh, or tea, if it's later. And um, so, so I'm, I'm still trying to get myself into the habit of reading scripture out loud. Sometimes I don't do that. But I find that I get more out of scripture if I read it out loud. So I'm just going to, this is part of my discipline. So I'm reminded that it's better for me if I read it out loud. Not that I have to read it out loud. So I'm just going to read it out loud, and, and I'm going to read it the way I might read it without you. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are at Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Father, thank you that in Christ you view me as your saint as your holy one not as a sinner but as a saint in Christ help me to be faithful before you in Christ grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ Father I'm dealing with fears and strife and and a lot of things would you just multiply your grace and your peace to me um, would you and, and, and you, Lord Jesus, multiply. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who for blessing me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in you, Lord Jesus, just as you chose me in you, before the foundation of the world, you knew my name. You knew where I would be when I would give my life to you. That I should be holy and blameless before you. Father, help me to walk in your liberating holiness and to be blameless before you at all times. In love, you predestined me to adoption as your son. Through you, Lord Jesus, to yourself. And you did it according to the kind intention of your will. Father, no wonder David said, One thing I have asked from you, that I am seeking, that I may dwell in your presence all the days of my life, to behold your beauty, your pleasantness, your delightfulness, and to meditate in your presence. To verse 6, to the praise of the glory of your grace, which you freely bestowed on me in your beloved. Thank you that Jesus is your beloved, but, but because of him, I am your beloved. Verse 7, in you, Lord Jesus, I have redemption through your blood. The forgiveness of my trespasses according to the riches of your grace which you lavished on me. In all wisdom and insight you made known to me the mystery of your will according to your kind intention which you purposed in Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you have made known to me the mystery of your will. That is, that I, a Gentile, would be included in your plan through your death and resurrection, Lord Jesus. And it's all with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. Thank you for correcting me. 
that I, I am frustrated, that I want things to happen quicker. I want you to do this, I want you to do that. But you always do things in the fullness of time. You know how to bring about that which you want to bring about. And when I stand before you, I will see your absolute, infinite, perfect wisdom and bow before you for your righteousness. That is the summing up of all things in Christ. Father, I can't wait for that day. Would you hasten that day? Things in the heavens and things on the earth. In you, Lord Jesus, also I have obtained, verse 11, an inheritance. Just astonishing. Having been predestined according to your purpose, hallelujah, you work all things after the counsel of your will. Help me to believe that. Help me to rest in that. Help me to know that you are at work in my life even when I can't see you. To the end, that as Paul said, we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13, in you, Lord Jesus, also, I also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of my salvation, having also believed, I was sealed in you, Lord Jesus, with you, Holy Spirit. You are the spirit of promise, given to me as a pledge of my inheritance with a view to the redemption of your own possession, Father, to the praise of your glory. And verse 15, and I'm going to pray what Paul prayed. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints. Well, Father, help me to walk in your love for your people. Do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. So, Father, I bring your people now before your throne of grace, including myself, that you, Father, the God of you, my Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would you give to us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you. I pray that the eyes of our hearts may be enlightened so that we will know what is the hope of your calling. What are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of your power toward us who believe? Father, I want to claim that for now and for Uganda, that you would move according to the, great, the, the surpassing greatness of your power toward us who believe. In Jesus' name, amen. There's my quiet time. Now, sometimes I, I have my quiet time like that. Sometimes slower, some, whatever. It's just different, but it's spontaneous. So now, how to get more, how to get much more out of the Word of God? So I read it. Nothing better than that. But I went deeper than that. I interacted See that with the one who inspired it. So I am sitting in front of him, before him, reading his word, talking to him from his word, praying his word, having his heart for others, allowing the Holy Spirit to convict me. Ah, my attitude is not right. Or maybe my attitude is right, but I know I need more love for the saints. Right? Um... And then you saw a couple areas, a couple of other areas where I, I branched off a little bit. I mean, who works all things after the counsel of his will? What an awesome, powerful verse. Yes. And what does that do? It, it causes me to, to be settled, surrendered, and submitted. You know what you're doing. And I can trust you. But see, what like what Rick said, What's happening? My mind is being renewed. I'm brought closer to him. I'm trusting him. I'm, in, I'm excited. I'm encouraged. You know, you just go all, all kinds of different directions with one verse. In fact, I'm actually even thinking, um, I need to, I know the verse. I know it by heart, but I feel like I need to 
um, put into my memory verse, literally. So uh, when I go through my memory verses, um, because this is recent, this, this will help me um, as I'm still preparing for my Uganda trip. So I just go to my little notebook in uh, my Bible, I mean my phone. I used to three by five cards, old school, and uh, they can get lost. So now I'm, uh, now I'm gonna put it right here. Who works all things after the counsel of his will. There. So now I gotta put in Ephesians one, is it verse 11 or 12? Yeah, 11. 11. So this will help me. Ephesians 1, verse 11, especially if things go haywire in Uganda. Or if, um, you know, I'm really concerned about all these cancellations on flights, delays. What's going to happen? What about that? I read an article that there's not enough baggage claim people, there are not enough pilots, there are not enough people at the counter, there are not of this, that, and I'm saying, whew, another thing I gotta pray for. I told Marine this whole trip is like a needle in a haystack. There's 10,000 things that could go wrong. Only God can get me there, get me home, make that trip successful, and, and work it so I don't get malaria, cholera, because no vaccination for cholera. Um, I did get a rabies vaccination. Well, that's, you would not believe how expensive those things are. It's unbelievable. And, and no COVID, because I, I can't get COVID before or during or after. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you see, so I'm thinking about that as I read, who, all, who works all things after the council as well. So now I'm applying scripture as well. See, I'm stopping, praying. You work all things after the council of your will. I need you to cover this thing and all the guys that are coming with me and, and uh, a woman, team of four, like I'm desperate. Praying God, pray with desperation, right? Thoughts, questions, comments. So that's just an example, but it's, it's, it's how I get much more out of the Word of God. I'm, I'm sitting here expecting God to be right here with me, speaking to me from His Word. Now, I can go in a, in a different direction. I can do this as well. I think maybe I already did it. I think I said thank you, that this and that. But thoughts, questions, comments. I love the way you interact because the Word is God-breathed. I remember yeah. once seeing a uh, artistic interpretation. I wish I could have found a way to purchase it, but it was like um, a person sitting there with the Bible open. Mm -hmm. But you also mm -hmm. saw like underneath Christ, just like he's just at the face of Christ, just speaking mm -hmm. while they were reading. Whoa! Because it is a lot. But just the way you interact, it also made me think of um, Brother Lawrence. You know, practicing yes. the presence of Christ. Mm -hmm. just constantly throughout the day and it starts right here yeah. just having thoughts of God and that's how you hear because we're having thoughts of God whether we're listening to you know, praise music or in the word or just thinking on him mm -hmm. he will breathe and speak to us But because I was reading along with you and then you were saying I said oh okay I see what he's doing yeah. Yeah. So first I was like does he have a different translation yeah. <laughs> like, what's going on with that way did I realize so I like that because it also made me think remember when we did the 21 days of prayer earlier this year mm -hmm. one of the apps was the pray first mm -hmm. and I still have that and uh -huh. one of, it has it has different categories but one is praying the scriptures praying the word mm -hmm. and so I need to do more of that. I love that because you just were having a conversation with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. He just asked me, what Bible does he do? <laughs> <laughs> he wrote that down because we were trying to, I'm wrong. and I'm thinking the same thing, what Bible do you use? Yeah, <laughs> it's the New American Standard translation. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I use that, I really like the New Living Translation. That's the NLT, which is a paraphrase. But the wording is really helpful. But I only use that as an aid, usually, when because the New American Standard can get a little archaic sometimes. 
Then I pull up NLT and I go, okay, that's what that means. But the New American Standard is the most literal translation, word for word, in the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. So I'm hoping that God will anoint my interpreters to speak word for word from English into Luganda. But the other thing I was came to mind as you were reading it and thinking back into that, I don't feel I can just turn to a verse in the Bible and read it like you have the mm -hmm. first time. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing that familiarity with the verse has to come first mm -hmm. with, with what's in it and then as you read it again and again, you interject more of yourself into it until it becomes very easy for you to have that conversation mm -hmm. with, with where you can imagine him there and you're talking and, and then interspersing and reacting to where it, what you feel mm -hmm. uh, and also basing it on what you are reading. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant point yes. that I wish I would have made. I absolutely agree with you. I wasn't always this way. So I'm, I, I'm doing a fast forward decades. But when I first started reading the Bible, I, I, I never knew. I, at least I don't remember. But, but I still do that today. And, and like I said, I have to remind myself, read it out loud. Um, so, you know, we're all growing. It, it, we do stops and starts, that kind of thing. But yes, I absolutely agree. The first, the best thing is just to read it and then pray it. But the benefit of that is, is the, the challenge for us is that we can read through Ephesians 1, okay, I'm ready to go to Ephesians 2. What if God says, nah, move back, go back over that again. Oh, but I've got to get somewhere. And God says, no, you don't. You need to absorb what's already there. Well, that means we have to slow down, right? It means we have to be patient. And um, and I got my notebook out, too. You know, I'm writing things down that I feel like the Lord is speaking to me. That increases my faith. So if I believe God said this to me, um, then in time, if I did hear him, I can look at that journal and say, you enable me to hear your voice because it did come to pass, just like you said it was going to. Now, sometimes I, don't, I miss him. Sometimes I believe this is what he said and it hadn't, hadn't come to pass yet. It still might. But even sometimes I'll write, I think you're saying this to me. Are you? Question mark. So that, that puts me in a place of faith but also humility because I know I can miss him and I don't have all that figured out. But what happens when I do hear him, it builds my faith and it encourages me so that I can be out on the lawn. I'm not a gardener, but I mow the lawn, and God can speak to me there, or he can speak to me when I'm walking up the steps or going down the steps. Anywhere, driving, through you. See, that's the other thing that's important, is we need to understand the body of Christ. God will sometimes refuse to say something to us because he wants to say something to us through someone else, and what that does is it makes me more dependent or, or knitted together and respectful of other believers because I don't have all the answers and I need the input of others, um, no matter who they are, whether they're children or, or whatever. That's God's way of saying, see, I have given, I've, I've given you the body of Christ as a gift. And we have to look at it as, as a gift because things happen in the church that that are scandalous or frustrating or wounding or whatever. But I made a decision years ago. You love your church. I love your church. End of story. Period. Exclamation point. That's what's kept me in the church because I have been undermined big time, but only by leaders. Never by people that are not in leadership. So that's okay. Crystal? Um, I was going to say, like, um, as far as, like, picking scriptures, it's never supposed to be, like, random as per se. It's wherever God leads you. Because sometimes, like, God was like, you remember that scripture you know, you were a kid? Today I go look at it. Mm -hmm. And then I read the whole chapter. And then, like, it'll lead me somewhere else. And then, like, after a while, like, from praying, it'll automatically just come up. 
does that meant to like work like oh I gotta open a scripture and find something to pray over myself today for example is like God leads you in that direction because sometimes we'll get to the place of acting like it's you know a spell per se and then it leads to another place but it's like we have God you know God led to because he knows what's coming up because there's plenty of times where yeah. like study this keep studying keep studying and then something happens and I'm like that's what keeps me during that storm mm-hmm. so it's like it's not like I have to I have to figure out how to do it like Pastor Brad does it it's like whatever way God is leading you as far as scripture it's gonna come up because the Holy Spirit like he knows the scripture and you're reading it and you're feeding it so it's gonna come up in That's prayer right. I'm glad you said you know, I don't have to do it like Pastor Brad. I don't want you to do it like me. I'm just throwing examples. And so if it sticks, great. If it falls to the ground, that's fine as well. I'm, I'm just trying to give examples. Um, let's do this. Let's let's dig. I'm going to erase this. Oh, wait, no. No? Uh, well, no. Do you want to take a picture of it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I thought you were going to write all that down. I like that old. Step away from the board. What do you have to do? you say about the prayer? You had a, a dream. Mm-hmm. And so is that that's weird. I mean, does that mean you're supposed to follow through with that dream or just pray for that person? Because I had a dream that was, yeah, about somebody in my family and it was so real. Yeah, I mean, I felt like I was there, just telling him, and he just, I mean, like you said, he just rebelled, wouldn't take it, wouldn't listen, wouldn't do it. And it's like, is that for me to come, yeah. go talk to that person, or is that for me just to pray for that? I mean, yeah, I just didn't know what the dream would have meant. You know, I mean, it was just so real. I felt like, wow, yeah. I was right there beside the guy, choking. Listen to me, listen. That's right. He wouldn't listen. He just won't listen. Just, I'm glad you brought that up, Kevin. I, I think so, I it's. I have to be careful. If I'm going to talk about something to explain it, yeah. usually I do. But well, I, plus, it's, it's a bad situation for me, you know, with drugs and things involved, and I don't need to be around them like that because, you know, I'm recovering or whatever. And so it's just like, I, I don't want to do that, God. I'm afraid to do that, God. I don't know if I should, you know. Mm. And I've talked to people of counsel about it, and they're like, well, no, don't put yourself in a bad situation. Always take a buddy with you, a Christian buddy that yeah. knows more than I do, obviously. You know, about what. So dreams, God does speak to us in dreams, but um, dreams are not like the Word, which is which is infallible and objective, right? Although we can misinterpret the Word, but dreams we can misinterpret dreams as well. So for me, if I get a dream, the first thing I do is if I can remember it. Then I think, okay, there's 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 a chance that that dream is from God, but I ask him. So is that dream from you? And I do the best I can to wait. Yeah. Um, because I have the conviction that he speaks in dreams, but I could also miss it. So so I pray about it. Is this dream from you? And if I start to get a sense. Then I'm asking for the interpretation. So I'm following Daniel's example. And I know that dreams can be, God can use dreams to confirm, to warn, to encourage, to um, to help us. So I, I went through, by the way, I said I've been undermined by leaders, never from Pastor Bob. So I want to make that clear. That that's never happened at Riverbend. See, I am thinking. Okay, be careful. Just think about what you're saying, um, and that's why I'm so grateful for this. Show. That's why you see that coming out, because I've I've really paid a heavy price, uh, like everywhere I've been, and uh, except here. So that I can't just say that publicly, but that's that's what's going on. But. God gave me two dreams, 2014, of three situations apiece. And I think what he was trying to tell me is that equaled six years of wilderness. And I didn't want to hear that. Because I had a friend who had been seven years a pastor friend. And I said, oh, God won't do that to me. 
And he did. He made me wait for six years. Two dreams of three delays. They were delay dreams. And the delays were ridiculous. Like, that just didn't even make sense. Then he gave me a dream of success that was all God, a supernatural dream. And it was of football, so God will give me some dreams in, in my world, so to speak. And, and that came to pass, year seven of this ministry. But I had to pray over those dreams. I had to wait. I had to be careful. I had to... So that, that's just a little bit about dreams. Yeah. First, if I can remember it, okay, I think that is, could be an indication that it's from the Lord. But I don't want to assume. So let me go to the Lord and say, is this from you? Yeah. Now I have to know whether I'm hearing from him, yes or no. And then what is the interpretation? But don't rush into it. Don't assume. Don't project anything in there. And But after that all happened, I look back and I say, I really did hear from God. <laughs> so that authenticates dreams as one of God's methods of speaking to us. He speaks to us in prophetic words. He has spoken to us to me through his church. God's got you right where he wants you. A 15-year-old girl said that to her mom. Oh, wow. Family, I'm really close to. Mom, I think Pastor Brad's, uh, God's got Pastor Brad right where he wants. You can't imagine how that blessed me. Because I knew God was saying that to me as I'm having trouble accepting it. So he sends a 15-year-old girl who's precious to me to say, boom. And and all the way through, he's He's done that because I got to tell you, those six years were hell. But God was working in those six years to prepare me to, for what was to come. Like Joseph. In a lot of ways, like Joseph. My favorite Old Testament character. That's, I, I that's, would say he went from prison to prime minister in one day, but he really didn't because he had to, but that's how God would do it. That, that's right. Like that. That's, that's right. And... Um, you know, the the past the, the church that I was pastoring, uh, maybe a little bit larger than River Bend, it was God just really used Maureen and me in, in phenomenal ways. And we loved that church so much and they loved us greatly. And then I got yanked out of it. It just was devastating. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took me a long time to recover from that. And I focused only on what they did and I couldn't see what God was doing. Mm -hmm. See, it took me a while to, to submit to God's power and authority. I'm looking at man, mm -hmm. and, and God is saying, yes, you're right. The way they did this was, was wicked. But I still can use what I don't ordain to accomplish my purposes. Mm -hmm. Now, I, Betty, I think God was trying to tell me, if I didn't get you out of there, you're going to die of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. So I was visiting to the doctors way too much. And the stress on me was unbelievable. And that elder board didn't lift a finger to do anything to help me. I was doing two full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. And, um, but years before that, I would worship to a Hillsong song called To the Ends of the Earth. Mm -hmm. And I would weep every single time I worshiped that song. Couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I would cry out to God, God, send me to the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. Cry out. But I never was, um, I never thought or dreamed, we never thought anything about missions. So well, that's good for them. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll give some money. We'll I, don't, I just did not have the right attitude. Right. I'm being a little <laughs> facetious. Don't take me too seriously. And then God said, no, I'm going to make you a missionary, but you're going to be, people say, what, you, what, what are you? What do you do? I say, I don't know. <laughs> Pastor Bobby said, you're a non-residential missionary. I said, thank you. That's what I am. Thank you for helping me figure this out. But that's where God had me. And, I mean, was moving me towards. But I'll tell you, for six years, it didn't look too, too exciting. So you just never know what God has in store when you're going through trials and tribulations. Yeah. If you just forgive, if you just wait, if you just hold on, press in, get in the word, don't stop praying, don't stop believing, in time God can work it out. And um, 
I miss pastoring. I miss preaching every week. But this is where he's got me. And so I am preaching twice a week. It's just I can't see the people, unfortunately. That's that's the challenge. I don't know what so. But that's funny, though. You're right, because after I had that dream the next following Sunday, the preacher's preaching about what the heck I was dreaming about. There you go. <laughs> There's the confirmation. <laughs> yeah. What was that supposed to mean? Come on. Yeah. yeah. It's just funny. And I even told Bob, I said, you know, I had a dream, and then you're preaching about it. What the heck is that? Whoa. I guess God's trying to tell you something. I don't know. Yeah. And just listen to what he said. See? And he's, he's gracious in confirming them. Yeah. How are we doing time-wise? Oh. It's on the phone. Shh. Wait a second. What, is this class, this group from 10 to 11.30, right? 15 minutes. Okay. All right. So let's, let's just, let's work towards the nature of God. Remember, I'm, I'm trying to share with you to get more out of the, God, oh, the Word of God. First, look into the nature of God. I would say to you that even when he's bringing judgment or discipline or wrath, you can still see the nature of God because the grace is the warning. See that? So there's, if you careful, we can put it together. Okay, so let's, let's just, in the time we have, let me throw things out. Blessed be the God and Father. Do you think, just in what you know about Paul, do you think he, when he wrote that, said, blessed be the God and Father? Do you think he, what was going on in his emotions when he wrote that word blessed? He was probably thinking everything that God and the Father had been to him, what he understood of them. But he's a Jew, right? So Jews are emotional, right? So... Did he just go, oh, blessed be the God. No. He was praised. He, I could imagine him writing that word and stopping and just lifting his hands. Because think about it. Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. It's a song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify Yahweh with me and let us exalt his... I mean, that's a powerful praise song. Do you think Paul knew that backwards and forwards? After? So I think what he's saying is, blessed be God with exuberance. Because Paul knows the nature of God, but he wants us to enter in to know the nature of God. Well, he's going to list roughly, don't, don't quote me, I, I think roughly 24 spiritual blessings. So he already knows what they are. He's going to write them down. Don't you think that he's about having, he's having a hallelujah time? Oh, yeah. I mean, maybe Paul got up and danced. No, no surprise there. So, so right away, I want to enter in with the Holy Spirit and with Paul. Blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So that tells me then... God is generous. God is good. God is magnanimous. But it's the spiritual blessings. What do we want? We want financial blessings. Right? <laughs> well, just give me the financial blessings. Now I'll take the spiritual blessings later when I get to heaven. And I don't need them. I don't know if you would say that, but sometimes Christians think that way, but let me align myself with what God is saying. See, mm -hmm. that's what's important. With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, what should my response be? What are they? I can't wait to find out. Mm -hmm. And But I can't move too quickly because they're, where are they? They're in the heavenly places in Christ. Yes. Now, the other thing I want to be able to do is circle... In, 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 in. I can't remember how many times Jesus is named. 50, someone say 15? What? Uh, there, it's a lot. Well, what is Paul trying to say? Everything about me is in Jesus. It's because of Jesus. It's through Jesus. None of this happens apart from him. This is the consequence of his resurrection. See, so now I'm being educated biblically and theologically, right? 
So what, what the Holy Spirit is doing is making me Christocentric, right? When Jesus is the focus of my theology, right? So I'm doing theology, it's life-giving, it's not boring. So this is the whole idea of Christology. It's the study of Christ. Theology, the study of God. Christology, the study of Christ. Eschatology, the study of last things. Uh, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit. Uh, ecclesiology, the study of the church, ecclesia. Yeah. And so on and so forth. So it's in Christ. So maybe, maybe I should stop and say, Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your mercy for me. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood. Why not? Why not have a worship time right there? Mm -hmm. And maybe at this point, um, like I did this morning, um, I sang the song Emmanuel. Awesome song. Mm -hmm. I was prepared to sing it, but wait, that didn't work out. Emmanuel. God with us, the focus of the deity of Jesus. All right, nature. So he says with every, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, if you got, if you got wheels on your chair, you can't, you can't just sit, you gotta push yourself back, lift those hands and just, and just be in astonishment and wonder. <clears throat> You chose me. Here's a good example, Cynthia. I just, I know I've said this many times, but when, in school when we play basketball, you know, you always have a captain, right? So I was always a captain of one team because I was really good, and, and then you had the other guy, captain. And I always made sure that I chose the kid that couldn't dribble, couldn't pass, couldn't play, but was standing there by himself. Because mm -hmm. I hated the thought. See, God was putting a pastor's on in me even then. I hated the thought of anyone feeling rejected. I wanted to dignify them. I couldn't have said that at the time. Mm -hmm. But what I said in my mind, I'm saying this to Cynthia because she, she is like an all-star basketball player. And I hope you don't mind me. <laughs> High school and Clemson. <laughs> Kind of jealous because I didn't play college basketball. But anyway, that aside from that, um, I would just say to my myself, I am not going to choose that person and then not give them the ball. If I have to walk over and hand it to them and let someone steal from, them, that's okay. And I'm going to tell them it's okay. I'll just play that much harder mm -hmm. to make up for when I could have chosen the other kid that the other captain chose. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at me like, you stupid. You know, what are you thinking? Well, I'll just play that much harder so we can win. That to me, God chose me. Because I was standing on the sideline. Mm -hmm. Worth nothing. But he chose me in Christ before he created the 100 billion galaxies with 100 billion stars and this earth. Now, that should, I don't know if I can find the words, it should do something to us the way we see God, see the nature of God. So now that, what the goal is that we close the gap that we put in our own minds, I'm unworthy, God's too busy for me, God's out here, no, he knows your name right David said Psalm 130 he knows when you get up and when you sit down when you sneeze when you cough the whole thing see that how to get more out of here much more out of the Bible study because this is his way of communicating to us you matter to me yes it's unbelievable in him before the foundation of the world, but, see now I have a responsibility though, right? I, don't I have a responsibility? That we would be holy and blameless before him. Five minutes, all right. Well, uh, can I erase this now? Yep. Yeah. Here is maybe the most important thing of all the things that we have learned today. 
because I would say that Christians do not understand what holiness is. We were intimidated by it. We think it's um, what I can't do. Uh, it's going to make me weird. Just different things. What is holiness? Well, let me bring it down to simple everyday things. Water. I cannot drink. I cannot let one drop of water in Uganda in my mouth because it will there's something in their water that my system is not used to. I can get cholera, mm -hmm. which you can die from. Mm -hmm. So I have to have one of these with me at all times, unopened, mm -hmm. that be, and that has pure water. Mm -hmm. See? Unholy, not necessarily for them, but for me, there's, it's contaminated in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. Montezuma's Revenge, you ever heard of that? Go down to Mexico. So I need this. Now, if I were to drop a little bit of poison, say, oh, does anybody have a bottle of water? I'm so thirsty. Sure, I do, but let me just, before I do that, let me just drop a little bottle, a little thing, a tablet of poison in it. Here you go. That's no longer holy. Mm -hmm. It is contaminated. Mm -hmm. What do we understand about what we want organic food? Right? Because mm -hmm. it's holy, right? It's set apart from food that is unhealthy. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So you see, holy is healthy. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. It is healthy. Uh, Paul, when he uses the word sound doctrine, the word is literally healthy teaching. Healthy. Right? As opposed to contaminated. Holiness is pure. Um, it's who God is. So if I criticize someone unjustly behind their back, that is impure speech. Right? As opposed to pure. Well, let's say I encourage someone in the Lord. That's pure. That's holy. See that? So what I'm saying is holiness is, is, is God's nature, which he's trying to conform us in, to. It's liberating. He's trying to conform us into his image. Right? But doesn't that take a whole lifetime? Yes. But it, it also means that we have to cooperate. Right? So we expect God to do everything. And he's saying, not you, I initiate your response. And because we can have a great attitude, pure, loving, holy, one minute, <laughs> and then the next minute <laughs> shift right back down in the wrong direction. But then what do we have that can help us to get back to holiness? It is repentance. Which is a gift from God. Which magnifies his nature all the more. Because if we repent, he forgives. Boom. End of story. That then helps us to get back into holiness, which helps us to become more like Jesus. And, and it's, I want to do this because, what does Paul say? He um, chose me in Christ before the foundation of the world. And then at the end of this verse, what verse is it? Um, or is it for in love he predestined me to adoption as a son. So he didn't adopt me so I could go work in the field for him. He didn't adopt me so I could go pick the fruit off the trees. 
He didn't adopt me so I could go sweep the floor. He adopted me out of love. But this is agape love. This is a giving, sacrificial, selfless love. Not just unconditional. It's a giving away love. So you see, now I know his nature, I want to be like him. I want to represent him well. I want to know him better. And that's, that is how I get much more out of the Word of God. So, Tim. Pastor Brad, what are the parallels between holiness and sanctification? I was about that too. Good, same thing. So, we are sanctified, which means what? What does sanctified mean? Conforming us into his image. What's that? Conforming us into his image. Well, yeah, maybe it's working to do that. That's sanctification. Technically, right. sanctification is to set apart. Mm -hmm. To sanctify something is to mm -hmm. set it apart for holy use. All right, so this is set apart. This is sanctified for my use. I am sanctified in Christ. I was sanctified the second I got saved. That's pretty powerful. I'm being sanctified because it's a process mm -hmm. and hallelujah one day that sanctification process <clears throat> will be done so that's where we can use the word we're saved mm -hmm. we're being saved and we will be saved so we're saved that's we're, that's a that's a done deal but the salvation process is really also mm -hmm. a maturing process it's it's the becoming like Jesus process. So the sanctification is the work of God that I carry out through the aid that God gives me. That's really what that, that is all about. But it's, it's holiness. It, it really is, you shall be holy as I am holy. Son, father. Daughter, father. I want to be like you. But what does it mean to be holy? Well, it means to treat you with respect and honor. That's holy. It means that I might need to humble myself. That's holy. It means I give a word of encouragement. That's holy. Yes, it means that I have to say no to some things. Right? I have to say no to some things. Why? Because I want to make sure this remains clean. So I don't want to get unclean in me. But if I do, then what do I do? Well, I drop a tablet in the water called repentance. <laughs> and the repentance dissolves in the water and makes it pure again. Amen. But all that is is just, Father, I've sinned. Would you forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness? See, mm -hmm. the forgiveness is the tablet that... You know, we don't have something like this, I guess. But there's poison in here, and then I, I repent, and then all of a sudden, now I can drink the water. It's just fine. It's called reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I knew that. <laughs> so, totally reverse. Yeah. See? See, God is good. It's not, why run from you know, my mom and daddy say, if you do something wrong, come to us. Don't hide from us, right? Mm -hmm. And, but that sinful nature wants to live in the darkness. But God says, no, 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 just come out and I will forgive you. I, I just want to make a comical reference to telling your daughters or your sons that I have daughters. And as they grew up, I told them, no matter what you did, mm -hmm. as long as you tell me, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to punish you. If, if it were an accident, I am not going to punish you for an accident. So they broke one of my bases one time, and, and I didn't punish them because I told them it wasn't an accident. So when my older daughter got an older, <laughs> young adult, <laughs> and going back to telling me, you can tell me anything. You can talk to me. You can tell me anything. And then some of the things she would tell me about herself or what's going on with herself or her body. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going like, I knew I was blushing 
But because I had told her that, mm -hmm. I had to receive it mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. uh, strengthened her belief in that she could trust me yeah. with whatever I said. And so I said, hey, sometimes you got to be careful when you do it as a child, then they do it as an adult. And you follow through with that. And that strengthens the trust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they have for you or with you. And, and I think it, it strengthens the bond. And then and that helps you know how to pray. Because I'll be yeah. like, I don't even know yeah. why you tell me all this. Yeah. And you just get to but, Jesus. but you also learn that that helps you become their adult friend. friend. Yeah. And, and that's Thank what you. I think I have with my daughters because of doing what you just said, mm -hmm. telling them something and letting them have the faith, the belief and the faith that mm -hmm. I'm going to follow through with it. And as they grew up, I did to the point where. I'm a little uncomfortable, but yeah. mm -hmm. I had to see it through mm -hmm. because that's what I had told them. And I think maybe that's that's what we look at when we think about God and we've done some things that are really, really against what he wants. But yeah. because he has said he will forgive us, that that forgiveness is there. However, we can't continue to go back and do that mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. after repenting so many times, you know, maybe God is thinking, are you really sorry, or you just using this as a way of getting mm -hmm. my forgiveness so you can go out and do the devil's work again. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that's outstanding. It's good. I, I think if... Well, then that will get into uh, yeah. a lot there, because you can... One of the reasons that David was a man after God's own heart is because as godly as he was and as fallible as he was, he owned it and repented. Yes, he did. You see, there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And he was always repenting of his transgressions, plural. Iniquities, plural. Sins, plural. Mm -hmm. Heavy stuff. So... So how much is too much? Yeah. On the one hand, you're right. People can use that to get away. Please forgive me because I'm going to do it again. Well, mm -hmm. that's where we need to cultivate a relationship with God so that we don't get to that place. Mm -hmm. But while at the same time when we say, I can't believe I did this again. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I did it again. I can't believe I did it again. You can't forgive me. This is seven times. You're not going to forgive me eight times. Yeah. Oh, but remember when Peter said, how often shall I forgive? My brother sinned against me and I forgive him up to seven times. Thinking, see, I'm learning Jesus. And then you see his shoulder slump when Jesus says, 490 times. Oh, 490 times. <laughs> well, if he said that, then that tells you how often God will forgive us it's of like our sin as yeah. well. It's like Romans 7, Paul even had that conversation, the good that I want to do, well, I don't do, and, you know, that's we do need Christ. Yeah. And, and we, sometimes our punishment is our own misery. <laughs> yeah. See, that's that's God will let us. That's what we learned from David in Psalm 32 when we mm -hmm. opened up. That's why that, that song mm -hmm. was so important. Because we're watching what David went through, and we should respond by saying, I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't want a Nathan coming to me. I don't want God's hand to be heavy on me. I want to do what's right before him. But yet at the same time, I see that David continue to be justified by faith. Mm -hmm. So you see, the, the Word of God is so beautiful, and holiness is attractive. It's not, it's not onerous. It's not, ah, I can never do this. It is, it's like a sweet-smelling aroma. That's what holiness is.